Welcome everybody. 95490, I see all of you. There you go. Thank you for being here. Well, we're going to possibly be joined by uh, Denise Rose, uh, Brookdale's manager, but we will, we're will we going to get started first. But I, I do want to take a moment to take uh, some introductory remarks, and I'm going to read some of those as, uh, as Carlin used to do, because that was a a good, a good move, so I want to get this information out to you. Okay. Um, this town hall uh, model began in Willits initially through the Willits Community Alliance, and we have recently reframed it from Willits Town Hall to 95490 Community Town Hall, because everyone in the greater uh, 95490 community should know that they have the opportunity sh to share their voices in the development and maintenance of community dialogue and action. We're interested in working towards a collective community process that includes all points of view. So thank you for being here and participating in this grassroots democratic process. It's important. So today's timed agenda is on the board, um, and we're going to try to stay on that schedule, which includes eight minutes per speaker presentation, uh, followed by an hour of public questions, answers, comments, and ending with 10 to 15 minutes of community announcements. So during the public section, please keep your comments and questions brief and to the point so that everyone will have an opportunity to speak. We will take a list of names and call on that list in order. So the topic for today uh, is what you think would improve the quality of life in this 95490 community and how we might accomplish that. So to start us off, we have three special speakers willing to share some of their ideas with us. Bruce Burton, Mayor of Willett City Council, uh, Denise Rose, Terrell's Township Manager, and Tom Woodhouse, their District County Supervisor. So we're going to start off with their ideas. And you guys can choose whoever wants to start. And that's you. Okay. <laughs> I was momentarily concerned about the subject for today, but it really doesn't matter because I just want to talk about what I want to talk about. I think you'll like it. My son was going to be here today and he called and canceled because he's working outside. It's too pretty of a day, but a whole meeting could be dedicated to him and his relationship with the kids and sports and education. And he has real courage and vision and he's inspired me on a lot of stuff. So he gets me all wound up and sends me to the school board. We have a real challenge right now. We committed the money, the $1.3 million, for the old auto shop to be renovated. And it's all done. It's beautiful. It's all full of woodworking tools, the state-of-the-art stuff, welding equipment, all these private stations with air protection and dust collection and everything. And they're not being used. There's maybe one class or one and a half classes a day. And the failure rate at the high school is just tremendous. The kids who cannot play sports or go on a field trip or do the clubs at lunch or any extracurricular activities, 40% of the freshmen can't be involved in that stuff. So the school is effectively failing, which to me means I'm failing, we're failing our children. I play with those kids and they're wonderful. They're really smart, really funny, and they have a lot of energy. But they need the community to get involved, and we're having a school board meeting where we're gonna talk about those statistics next week, the week after this, and try to encourage them to train kids with real life skills, whether it's firefighting or scrubs for nursing, wood shop or welding. You can get great jobs and make a lot of money, and it keeps kids in school. Of those freshmen that are all failing at this point, they're not going to graduate school. And that means each one that leaves, we lose about $7,000 a year that's given to us for training them. So quickly, if you add that up, if you just kept six of them in class, you could hire a great woodshop teacher. So we're putting the pressure on. It's on my supervisor webpage. And we're encouraging the community to come help. It's going to take a consistent effort, both... Wood and McGuire are behind this and have a bill for shop. There are communities out there who have to organize and start from a dirt yard, build the building, get the equipment. We don't have to do that. We already paid for it. We're going to be paying for it for the next 40 years. We need to fill that class with kids and keep them in school and motivate them and give them hope and get this next generation, give them the chance that we had 
we're very lucky. They deserve the same thing. I always choke up about kids and get emotional, but I really care. I think it's one of the most productive things we could do, and it's exciting. Being around kids energizes us, gives us purpose, and inspires us, and we get far more. We went to Wowser the other day, had a great time with them, and they're working and they're reaching out, trying to get deeper connections with the community and with business, and to keep their dream alive too. So the time is now to reinvest in kids. The kids are worth it, and I'm going to just speak about this wherever I go. It's another issue I'll just use up all the time I can. I want to be ahead of some issues. I'm concerned about what's going to happen to Willis when the highway is given back to us. We have a group meeting, and we've been meeting for years with lulls in between about our sidewalks and our downtown area. So people, it's the time to jump in, get your ideas. We're going to be doing some charrettes, and we're getting grants, and Bruce is leading this. We can make our town whatever we want. I think we've burned up all our equity. Our streets are failing. Our kids are failing. It's time to reinvest. People built all this stuff out of nothing. All we have to do is repair it and keep it going and do what's already been done before. It's not impossible. We need to focus our good intentions. I think good intentions are great, but really it's action that gives you that feeling of reward at the end of the day. If you think about raking the yard and don't do it, at the end of the day you don't feel good, you feel crummy. If you do it, it makes you feel good and you sleep better. So I'm kind of a simple person and I want to do this active stuff with you and partner up and make this town better. I'll give you a break and let you hear something a little more intelligent than that. Well, luckily we have another speaker that maybe can accomplish that. <laughs> So, um, first off, uh, uh, thanks for doing this and thanks for inviting me. Uh, you know, the, the headline that I was kind of working from is, um, what, what's a vision to make Willits better or, or how do you see the, the future of the community? And um, I can't help but think of a, a little story regarding that, that that I remember. Two stories, really, just to, to kind of paint a picture. The first, and in, in kind of in order, when my dad finished uh, college in uh, Berkeley in 1947 or so, he was looking for a job, and um, he started applying for jobs, both in the Sierras, I mean he was a forester, and, uh, and also here along the coast. And uh, one of the jobs that uh, he was offered was to be a forester for Willits Redwood Products, the sawmill that was owned by Russell Ells. And if you know Kathleen Lewis, it's her father. But nonetheless, there, and he was offered a job in Cloverdale. And then he was offered a couple jobs up in Humboldt County, um, one for the Pacific Lumber Company. But it doesn't make any difference. The point of the story is, is that my mom came from Chicago, came from downtown Chicago, living on Lakeshore Boulevard in Chicago. And as she came up the North Coast in 1948 um, and saw the communities, she told Dad, she said, and Dad really had some nice offers for jobs up in Humboldt County, and, but she, she came up to Willits and said, this is as far north as she was going to go. <laughs> She said, you know, at that point, well, it's just had Main Street was paid, maybe Redwood Avenue, but no, no other streets in town. And so I thought, you know, that's quite a leap for a gal that grew up on Lakeshore Boulevard in Chicago. And that's, uh, you know, a testament to what the town was. Following on that, um, as a kid, we used to ride through town with our folks and we counted bars gas stations, and and churches in town. And um, I can't remember exactly, but but they w within a, a, a number of one or two, there was 26 gas stations, 27 bars, and 25 churches. They were about the same in the mid-20s. And uh, now you go through town, we have 
five gas stations, five or six gas stations, two or three bars, and we still have 25 or 30 churches. <laughs> so, you know, that's what ch that's <clears throat> kind of what's changed in town and what hasn't uh, in a very in a very simple uh, statistic kind of way of looking at it. Changes are are still to come. Changes with the freeway, changes with the hospital, some that seem more positive and some that seem that might be more challenging. Uh, I've been involved in local government now since 1992 as an elected person, and the continual challenge is obviously funding local government. And I've never looked at that job as that I was, uh, you know, you get on certain board of directors of certain organizations and you're there to be a fundraiser, you know, you're there to help the group raise money. And I've never looked at my role as in city government as being a fundraiser or necessarily an advocate for higher taxes. It's, it has been to try and spend the money that we get in the most efficient and effective manner that we can. And uh, whatever we get is what we get. Uh, to that end, uh, I still think that the challenge for local government uh, it's kind of the last and, and the, to me the only real accountable level of government and the level of government where, where there still is a level of public trust and uh, I think that's really important. I think you spend a lot of your effort to accumulate it and every once in a while you have to spend some of it and uh, <clears throat> in the half cent sales tax measure that the city put forth uh, probably over 10 years ago now for transportation is one of those ways that you spend some of that public trust. Some of the rate adjustments that we have to do in water and sewer are ways that you spend public trust. But more to the point, I look at that we have to look at the resources that we have in our communities and try and work more wisely with them and figure out how they can help fund local government. And in particular, uh, for the city, I look at the, uh, our property at the watershed. We're really in a unique situation. Actually, Brook Trails and the city are both share a fairly unique uh, attribute in this way. We have, we own our watershed property, 3,500 acres. The Brook Trails has, I think, something close to 5,000 uh, 5, acres of, of quote unquote green belt. Uh, you know, over the course of my 20 some odd years at the, at the city, We've done some timber harvesting on the on the watershed several times. Uh, that money's all gone into the capital improvements of the water system. We've done some gravel extraction up there with the uh, quarry uh, that has again gone into the infrastructure of the city. And I really think that that's uh, you know th those sorts of activities are are key to helping offset the effects of just trying to raise cost to the community all the time every time you need an improvement made. I think there's also some opportunities that we're going to see uh, in the years ahead with, uh, well, we got to find those opportunities, you know, uh, wherever they sit within the community. Government's not really supposed to be in the business of being in business, but when it comes to an alternative of, of just taxing people so that you can continue to, to uh, you know, maintain or enhance programs, it's, uh, I think that's got a, a limited curb appeal, and I think that is, to me, that's a, just an expense of public trust. We're really committed, you know, I, I, I do want to just, uh, and I'm sure people have questions about this or have concerns, or, and we'll probably adjust, get addressed more, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But the relinquishment of Main Street is a, going to be a, a significant change to the community. I'm really excited about it. I think it's one of the best things that will happen, you know, in our uh, lifetime here to get our community back. We've really had a dividing line in our town. It's, it's been Main Street. It's, and, you know, we all identify town by west or east of 101. And whether it's just maintaining our infrastructure uh, in, in the Caltrans right away, having them as a partner in your community, them owning the rules and regulations regarding how the Main Street merchants can advertise their business or
how they can access their business, uh, you know, what kind of ingress and egress, all is subject to their, their control. So that coming back into local control is going to be really, really an important asset to the community. Then how we can somehow integrate that into getting people to come back downtown or to increase the use of our downtown area and make it more visitor friendly and more consumer friendly is is something the city has been working with some merchants groups it's been working on its own it's been working with with the chamber of commerce and and i think we've got some exciting things coming down the road that way that are going to really ease that transition you know tom and i were talking just briefly before the meeting you know as has this happened in many communities there's some growth inducing or there's some growth pressure to the interchange areas uh and outside the community outside uh our authority and uh you know we at the city would very much like to see that minimized limit that try and maintain those uh, essential services to be within the city and not be a particular not to see that to be a really growth inducing measure I, I see some limitations to that with the wetlands designation and some infrastructure issues around that but you know people are pretty imaginative when it comes to solving those kinds of dilemmas and and I, and I you know it's going to be important for us to work with the county on that and maybe people want to talk about that some more too you know, those are the main things. That the really exciting thing that's coming on is, you know, it keeps getting kicked back a little bit, but the new hospital, you just cannot, um, you, just, you just can't overestimate how valuable that is to the community. Uh, it is uh, a, you know, a real investment by the Adventist Health and, and the Howard Foundation to do that. Um, it's a really unique uh, hospital in you know the, the, the Frank Howard the Frank Howard Hospital in that it has been a money-making institution and the Coast Hospital has been in bankruptcy it, it, it may be just coming out but I'd like to say it's been in bankruptcy several times and I don't mean to make it difficult for it but but it, it certainly Howard Hospital is a shining light and even in the Adventist Health Group uh, of all the hospitals they operate Howard Hospital is their is their their best performing facility, and uh, I think when we see that move uh, complete and uh, see you know the opportunities that that brings to the community, that that's going to be an important uh, part of our future. Thank you for this. two stellar people, but, and this is an odd position to be if managers, particularly uh, municipal type managers, don't get up in front of people and share their thoughts about what a community should be. Our job is to facilitate other people's <coughs> conversation, to bring ideas from other places in, but to facilitate your conversation about what you think the community should be, and to help help you do that. Um, and to work with government officials and the community to bring that vision to life. So really it should be you up here, not me up here. It comes down to what is it you want? You know, a, a city, what is this city? Um, why are you here? What do you love about it? What don't you love about it? What would you change? What wouldn't you change? How can we all make better connections? We all came here for a reason. We were born here, we decided to stay here, we came here from other places. Community is in all kinds of places here in the city. It's in the churches, it's in Safeway when you go into Safeway and meet your neighbors. Um, it could be at the picnic grove or frontier days where you get together and have a family reunion sometimes surrounding it. So then what we all need to talk about is what makes community for us. Is it the space that we have here? What particular buildings do you love? What buildings do you hate? What outdoor thing make, really makes your spirit soar when you get to walk down the street? Or what places scare you a little bit? You know, because all places have little scary things, especially if you're a little kid, 
Some places are adventurous, some places are scary, some places are beautiful. Those are the things I think that we need to all think about to develop that common vision. And this is not a new question for, for communities around this country or around this world. There are lots of places that have had lots of changes to go through and having to decide what today and tomorrow will bring us so that we can thrive. Um, in some places, it's the arts community that forms the foundation of, an, of new growth. Sometimes it's sports. There's lots of places, let's say in Arizona, where spring training is everything right now, and that builds the new community. Some places it's having nightclubs. I don't think that's us too much. Um, some places it's having lots of places to dine and sidewalk eating. Um, other places it's community. Dying. Dying? Yeah. Why does it die? <laughs> <laughs> well, you might die sometimes. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's intergenerational stuff. And I think one of the things that, especially us who get older up in our 50s and 60s and what have you, is that we forget that people who are 10 years old sometimes have better ideas than we do. The conversation should include everybody. In, in the future. And there are all kinds of places that you can go and look at um, methods that people have used. There's a guy named, I think, Henry Butler, who has this thing going. He teaches in Colorado and goes around teaching in communities and talks about building community from the outside in. And really what that means is the neighborhoods, um, the CYOs, all building a community of effort towards a common vision. Um, and then bringing it up to government. Government can't make community, but government can facilitate the conversation and can provide the support that people need to coordinate effort and to find funding and commonality. I really think that's probably, and also to access grants. Um, sometimes government can do that. Um, there's a, in New London, which is a place where I recently worked, it was, it has all these great things going for it because it's on the coast, it has the Coast Guard Academy, but it's also a really kind of run down kind of place. It's downtown, got decimated for a lot of reasons. It's intersected by a number of highways. You think 101 is bad, have, have Route 95 go through your center. Mm -hmm. Not so much fun. Mm -hmm. And that's true for other cities along the East Coast. And here too, where the five and other things have intersected and bisected communities and destroyed them, those communities have had to remake themselves. In New London's particular case, it was, I think, five or ten people getting together and buying an old diner and making it into an art gallery. That art gallery, their big thing is they have this salon des independents. I can't speak French, so. But it's, a, it's an independent salon where um, it, everybody is invited, no matter your level of skill or what have you, to put one piece in an art show. That one event and that one place generated a lot of art galleries in the, in the town and a lot of events that surround that particular thing. Dances, all kinds of things go on during that week. It's the dead time of year because um, it's in January. But that one place also built, uh, has uh, housing. It, it bought a number of downtown buildings or help support a number of downtown buildings to uh, improve upstairs apartments so that they could be accessible. It got the city to provide some money to um, do uh, rent support for businesses that wanted to locate in the downtown. And it started a garden that became a place for the community to gather. And ga gathering places are important to building community. And I just want to recommend one book before I shut up. And that's uh, by a guy you wouldn't think of as having much to say about what creates community. But his name is Daniel Pink. He's mostly known for um, things about selling. He does a lot of books on sales and what have you. But this one particular book called A Whole New Mind is about right brain thinking and how community has existed over time, how societies have been built and what the new age, this age, means for us, which is a conceptual kind of future. It's an interesting book, and it has a lot of good ideas for 
local government and local communities about how we can change our environment and improve our environment to bring the future that we want. So that's kind of my spiel. I also have a couple of handouts that I brought along about community economic gardening and uh, four questions <coughs> which you might want to think about. And that is, um, think about five things about Willits that's most, that are most important to you. Make a list of five things that you would improve about Willits. Name one place in Willits that you really love and one place that you would improve. And finally, what you would do to recreate or create new community here in Willits. That's great. So before we open up to questions and comments, I, I just want to encourage everybody to, to um, contribute uh, the ideas of what they really want to see happen, specifically as citizens, beyond your roles as government, or but as private citizens, what, it, what is it you really want to see here? And then let's talk about how that can happen, not a matter of what, what you know, maybe if we think about it too much, it's like, well, uh, we can't do it, there's not enough money, or something like that. Let's just get some ideas rolling about what possibly could make some things uh, really good for this community. So we're going to take some names um, and record them on the board, and then we'll go in that order for questions and comments. Yes? The other thing we want to do with this is we want ideas for topics for future meetings, things that you'd like to hear discussed, and uh, things that you would like to hear discussed. That's right, because we are recording this for posterity. We really would like your input. It really does make a difference to us. We really do want to know what you would like to discuss here. First of all, I'd like to thank these three people for their time. I know they're very busy. I've got three silly little things, but then Tom brought up a very important topic for me. I spent 26 years as an administrator, high school and Bosser Lane, 19 years at the high school and seven at Blosser Lane. So I have a deep investment in uh, the school system. I've tried politically to stay out of the who's running it and whatever, but it's got pretty serious lately. And I've been at two or three different meetings about the concerns that Tom had about the lack of uh, opportunity for kids in vocational arts. And I came away with, from the meetings with mainly the superintendent uh, not completely satisfied. Uh, you know, they have, they have what, one period of woodshop now? We used to have eight. We could have had 16 uh, periods of woodshop. You, you, kids had to, my son had to wait till he was a senior before he could get into the woodshop class. Uh, and she says the kids don't want to take woodshop anymore. And I, I don't think that boys especially have changed that much <laughs> since I was there. That was a woodshop, auto shop, metal shop, uh, construction. I could go on and on and on. And they, that's where they went, which I think plays partly into the way things are run. They only have six periods or five periods. And... Uh, the number of kids that are failing is, I used to be, I was commissioner for athletics for 27 high schools and I did eligibility hearings all the time as part of my job. And you have to maintain a C average. And at Willits High School, you can't flunk a class. Now a lot of schools don't have that position. That's one thing I put in years ago because in school you have to work to flunk. <laughs> Teachers will give you a D just if you show up and breathe. Uh, but an F, you have to work at it. So anyway, I appreciate you uh, bringing that topic up. And if you want to do something about it, look in the newspaper when the school board meets and attend. Okay? I can go there and flap my lips, but I, it, it's, I have a catch-22 because working there for so long... I don't want to be, well, he's old time or whatever, whatever, so. But I have gone to meetings and I am concerned and I stay concerned. Tom is a very, very personal friend of mine, so we communicate. I got a new phone, so I got some things I wrote on here. 
on my brand new multi-million dollar phone. I bought this phone, my wife got a 99 cent phone. I got one of those. Yeah, yeah? Okay, I have some things that I think, uh, one is the alley. That alley, you know, is different than most alleys. Because it houses our community theater and people are coming from all over the place now more and more we have singers there we have bands coming in there we have plays and so on and I walk my dogs a lot and I walk down there it's a death trap you don't want to do it at night you well that lady I saw in the newspaper she fell on her face uh, it's got potholes, it's got patches and patches, and then patches on top of the patches. And you need lights on that alley. Second thing is the sidewalk by Rexall. Mm -hmm. is extremely dangerous. Now these are all personal things for me because I walk my dog's life. The intersection of West Mendocino and School Street has many cars are not stopping. I've talked to the police, I've talked to the chief, and it's, well, we can put a car there. Well, of course, you put a peace car there. They all stop. And uh, I said, can't you put an unmarked car? No, it's against the law. I said, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, I have um, a bunch of ideas I just want to put out there, and maybe some other people will pick up on some of them. And they're not all original by any means, because a lot of us have these same concerns. So uh, buildings that uh, really bother me, Remco and the Van Hotel are way up there at the top of the list. Would love to see those get used uh, yeah. for the community and improved. Um, actually, John's place now, <laughs> another one on the list. Um, and um, I would love to see us improve our internal um, circulation. Our road system is basically, even with the bypass, whenever that is finished someday, um, it's still going to be clogged because we only really have one sort of north-south squeeze and I think there are some things we could do about that. And another thing that I know uh, Bruce has brought up and I think um, I'd love to have it get talked about in the community is a um, recreation district, something that could fund um, a lot of the, um, the activities that the entire 95490 benefits from that are located in the city limits and the city budget can't handle providing all of that stuff. So we, you know, we have so many of those um, and it would be a real opportunity to, to serve the entire community better if we could pass a, a recreation district and it means getting a two thirds vote, I believe. So it would have to have a lot of support like, like Measure A did for the libraries. Um, those are just a few of the top of my list. And of course, uh, one that's been brought up too is Main Street um, getting ready for way in advance of the relinquishment so that we can have a much more pedestrian friendly and com uh, commerce friendly area um, in improved before Caltrans walks away from it and says, you know, it's on you now. Uh, we want to do that because they're going to come in and repave it once. That's it. That's our, I mean, we've got to do it before then. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's John Almeida. I went to school when Chuck was the principal there. <laughs> so, vocation was a big thing. I mean, I went to work at Remco for 18 and a half years, and we made a lot of stuff, and this, this community was really a humming. Between the logging and the, and the machine shop, really did a lot. And when I was in school, we didn't worry about going to college, because we could make as much working in one of these places, either logging or working at Remco, because those were high dollar jobs, believe me, big high dollar jobs. And that chrome department didn't have to kill Remco. There's a lot of things that can be built right there, right now, that we used to build that doesn't need to be plated. But I'll save that for another topic. My main topic tonight, and has been in the past, is the Railroad Avenue Bechtel Road connection. If you want to cure the plug, that's where you need to work. It means so much to me that I took time off from work and went to MCOG. I personally know Phil Dow from different projects before. If the city of Willis would promote this properly, instead of being number 20th on MCOG's list, it would be number five and be getting close to being shelved already. When I went down there, I looked at a seven page draft from the city of Woolwich, and I could tell right there it would never pass for funding. So I wrote a cover 
page on top of that and gave it to each member there. Unfortunately, the third district supervisor who was sat on there at that time was not there. Hopefully Tom will be there whenever it needs to be. Because this corridor is only 2,600 feet long, can be built without tearing down any houses, has, some property, has one property owner that would trade property without funding trade for another piece of property that Willits has. It, it would be the greatest thing that would keep that plug at Safeway opened up. Phil Dow himself said, when Highway 101 is complete, you will still have that plug there. They know it. They know that that plug's still going to be there. But the thing is, you want to keep Highway 20 traffic coming through there for the funding and the tax dollars. Those businesses south from Safeway and south have parking, even for big rigs. You can bring a big rig into Burger King. You know, 101 trailer, you name it. There's several businesses. RVs can pull into Evergreen Shopping Center. RVs can pull into Safeway Shopping Center. Your tax base, your big portion of your tax base is going to be right there. And your weekend and summer traffic is going to mean a lot to this community in tax dollars. You don't ever want to give that up. You don't ever want to put a highway intersection from the freeway straight through. You'll change the demographics of this town and you'll kill businesses. What this will do, nobody will know about that's traveling through, but it will let the locals get around who already get around already. Now, I've been told by one person, well, you know you're going to dump everybody on Commercial Street. No, that's wrong. That's false. There are several arterials after you get past Safeway. Right now, if you look, when it's busy, it plugs South Street all the way back down to Central. But if you provide a different arterial around the back side, you're going to allow traffic to come back to Safeway if they want to come to Safeway via Oak Street, or you're going to allow them to go to the post office via East Valley Street, or you're going to allow them to disperse out in the valley if they want to go home and they live in the valley or Hearst or Red Hill or any place like that. And yes, there's three arterials that will dump out into commercial, and that's Humboldt, Madden, and Lenora Street. And that's going to dissipate traffic. That eliminates the plug. So 101 is going to help but it's not going to completely cure it. And Phil Dow said that himself. By the end of that meeting, if our presentation from the city would have been proper, there was two things Phil Dow wanted to see. We had votes for it to pass that day. Two gentlemen from the coast, Dan Jarity, the uh, supervisor, was for it. Councilman, one of the councilmen was for it. A Ukiah councilman, Benj Thomas, was for it. There were several people who were for it, but we would have had the votes to get the money. So my last thing I want to say is that if you document the connector first, they'll bring that up. And if you, they know you have $900,000 a year as far as a half cent sales tax dedicated to road repair. And if you can pony up some money that'll show them that you're serious, you will get this thing funded and it will be the greatest benefit. The thing you don't want to see is start putting bulb outs on Main Street and roundabouts, and you can't get your truck traffic down here on Commercial Street. Schuster's got to come this way. Deliveries to Mendham Mills got to come this way. The county low bed's got to deliver equipment in and out of here into Brook Trails and so forth. You got to be real careful what you do on Main Street until you get another corridor going. So please think about it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I think what John talked about is uh, probably our biggest challenge revenue. The economic health of the city of Willits. When when Bruce was young, there were more businesses, more jobs available here, and uh, this goes right to the vocational training. Uh, back 20, 30 years ago, you could go through a vocational program at Willits High School and get a good job. My concern specifically is what Bruce mentioned, with pressure to grow on interchanges outside the city. We have property in the city that could pretty much uh, eliminate that pressure by developing the property in the city, but we need the infrastructure. And I know we do have plans to extend the water main from commercial north to, to the end of the city limits. I think we need to do that really soon. Uh, we've, had, uh, we, we've had inquiries in the past about being able to develop the farthest north piece of property in the city limits. Um, with the kind of development that's being pressured for the interchanges. If we were able to make that move first, 
then I think we could at least get a large part of that. And uh, that's where our revenue comes from in the city of Lawrence. Uh, we, we need to be able to uh, extend the infrastructure so that these businesses can happen. Uh, that's pretty much, and I think, I think that's the most important thing we need to do. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Jed Diamond. Uh, I was co-founding of the Willits Healthy Action Team and Community Alliance and some other things. I want to just emphasize a couple of things that resonate for me in what's said. I think what John just said about another quarter is very vital. Uh, what Tom was saying about getting the kids involved and us supporting the kids is vital. I think what Bruce said about the hospital is... Uh, you know, a resource is vital. And I want to just suggest something that is a way to tie a lot of these things together. You all know that we do these walks uh, twice a year in October and May. Next big walk is coming up on May 31st. And what I can tell you is there's nothing like boots on the ground. There's nothing like actually seeing from the, the road where the bottlenecks are or connecting the east side and the west side and walking on Main Street to actually see the things that we can do. And it takes about an hour and a half to make the circuit on the 10,000 steps. So you get a chance to talk to the community. You get a chance to talk to the kids because the kids have been involved from the beginning and different ages and people from all over. So I just encourage taking some of these ideas and, and walking with them together as a community as a way that we can all not only bring our ideas together, but we can put them into action. And by the time you make a circuit, you may have made some new connections or made some decisions about what needs to be done that we can all put into practice. So I hope you'll all come out for the next walk, May 31st, and just find other ways. Don't just wait till the walk, but walk together. Be out there, grab a few people and walk in our community and feel what we can do, what needs to be done, what we love. I love what Denise said about really, you know, experiencing what do we love, what don't we love, actually experience it and sharing it. So thanks. Thank you. It is so nice, I don't want to put you on the spot, but so nice to see, see these beautiful young women here. <laughs> We're really happy to have youth come to the meetings. It's really, really important to our community and to us and to me. Um, I have a question that I never have gotten an answer for. When Cloverdale was uh, here talking about uh, adjusting after the freeway went by their place, um, and they have three uh, significant exits to their town, um, is there a way that we can annex, can we take Willits city limits out closer to the freeway? so that we can get the revenue from gas stations and so on, or food that is being sold out there or whatever. I don't understand what the process is with that, but they said they did something like that. Bruce, do you know what that's about? I mean, annexations are a, uh, you know, we did a southeast annexation in the city in, in 88, I believe it was, that that's what brought the hospital and that whole area into the city. That was outside the city before and we, we serviced that with some redevelopment money to put to extend sewer out there. You know, I, it's gotten a little more complicated with LAFCO. LAFCO is really the, the controlling agent on, on annexations. But, but it's a process. There is a process to go through an annexation or to, to attempt an annexation. Um, you know, that one was done just before I got on the council, so the actual... Um, process or, you know, the, the deal. I'm not up on the, the proportions of how it actually goes forward, but I know it has to go through LAFCO and, and it is not a not a, a minor process. Well, it's a major LAFCO process. Is. Local Agency Formation Commission and, uh, and the Willits uh, participates. Holly, aren't you on LAFCO? Yeah. To me, it's where every good idea goes to die. I mean, I have never seen LAFCO accomplish anything positive. So, but I might be a little biased, uh, but uh, <clears throat> but nonetheless, they, they do have a lot of authority, uh, and it's to essentially to prohibit urban sprawl, you know. I mean, it's to define borders to communities. 
But um, but there is a process through it, uh, you know, and I won't belabor that. But Chris, what about sphere of influence? Is that something more flexible? Well, you know, sphere of influence. We we just finished doing a uh, MSR, which uh, tries to help define your sphere of influence. Uh, it's a term that's thrown around. I'm not really. No one's demonstrated to me what having a sphere of influence, uh, what authority that gives you in the decision-making process outside the city's borders. Uh, and we certainly um, made an effort in this MSR to to uh, get a recognition that the new interchanges were with going to be within the sphere of influence. No one's made clear to me what what authority that gives the city to have any impact other than some uh, notification and, and and maybe Adrian or others might be more equipped to address that but but we're uh, we're we're testing the waters of what sphere of influence means as we speak can I make a comment on that and I wanted to put it in my initial remarks but I didn't want to be a bummer but it's very serious right now the county all the supervisors see our budget as a flat line budget. We don't have an increasing amount of money to work with. And our costs are going up. The demands of what the public wants us to do continue. The city faces the same challenge. We want everything from them, but we don't want to pay any more taxes. And so we're all primed, like we weren't 10 years ago, to vote yes for growth and tax-based revenue. We will approve things that we wouldn't have approved 10 years ago, and even if I voted against something outside, say at that Apache Mill site north of Willits, it's zoned industrial, and I've heard just whisperings of a truck stop or gas station fast food place there. It would be approved by the supervisor over the howling of Willits because we have to have some jobs and some growth around here. We've kept it back, but we've almost falsely created a pent-up demand. Remember from the Bay Area where we came from, we did that and then it would come eventually and there'd be huge growth and people would just move out to other areas. We're facing that same challenge, I think, and I think we need the courage to talk about this, dig into it and get ahead of the problem rather than always chasing the problem with voices that aren't heard and ending up with what we got. If we didn't learn anything from the bypass, hopefully we learned that. I'm sick of hearing things when it's too late to do anything about it. So I'm begging people to look into this. I'm worried about it. We all should be, I think. Not out of fear, but out of intelligence. I was interested in knowing, uh, maybe I missed this at the beginning, but uh, I'm looking for ways th that will offer opportunities for health and exercise. Jed's uh, creating of the wet walk was really incredible, and then it's still going. But I'm thinking about the valley and how much I'd like to ride my bike around the valley, how much I think that that would bring folks in to have... You know, we have such a beautiful area here. So walk, uh, had the opportunity to walk on Hail Creek uh, Trail a while ago. I'd love to see that expand up to Howard Forestry Station through the, you know, through the uh, back hills there. Just more expansive opportunities for exercising, bike riding, and hiking. And I'd love to see something happen with that van hotel before I die. Yeah. <laughs> When I heard things about um, working with the kids, and that's something we're trying to do at Wowser. And one of the things I'd like to put out there now that can be done tomorrow, rather than, rather than having to wait for funding for the, uh, for the shop classes at the high school, is to be able to meet with the high schools and have them send some of their poor performing kids over and check out the difference in what happens when the kids are becoming not just builders of something, but designers. And this is a question, or this is something I heard over and over at a little summit we had at Wowser, that the larger employers can't get people that know how to use the CAD design packs. The colleges can't get enough people in the classes where they could put on a class. This is something we could do with the employers and just do one or two people in a class and they don't have to go out of state. The other thing, we need some more technically savvy kids to be employees for any prospective businesses that you want to come into Willits that are 
21st century businesses. And another thing I wanted to say is when we look at being, having an identity that will draw people into Willits in the future, if they're putting you know, things at the bypass exits and, and growing those things, is we have people here that are very into growing their own food and into sustainability and into making things. We have three theaters and we have artists and we need to grow an identity around those things that will draw people in here. Thank you. I just wanted to jump back to that, the, the pathway idea and, and a couple things that come to mind. Uh, number one, you know, Willits just is finishing or just finished a new wastewater treatment plant. For the, those of you who haven't been out there, there's three uh, finishing ponds that are probably 20 acres a piece. I, I, they're big, and there's a nice trail. There's a nice road all the way around those. Once the freeway's done, and they have this in, at, at Arcata at the at their treatment area as well. That's a wonderful area out there, and and, and we certainly at the city would like to make that available to the community when the construction stuff is done and tie that into there. The other thing that I've advocated for and I and haven't made a lot of progress uh, with is, that, is, is again with our watershed. Uh, for those of us that are lucky enough to have access to that, uh, you know, for doing official uh, city business, uh, <laughs> there are, you know, uh, a, a trail around Lake Centennial. It has, you know, there's some issues with highway in, access in and out but 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 there are some things that are coming along uh, that that have trail access for the community I just wanted to mention those two Thank you. I talked to Charlie Fielder Friday we were playing phone tag for a long time and like he's the district big wig of district one for Caltrans and like Bruce we have a good relationship with each other and he doesn't know I'm going to be a pain in the neck to him, so he really likes me now. But <laughs> I'm luring him in slowly. But the mitigation land is something that was agreed to by Caltrans. It's like when you want something really bad, they want it to bypass, they agreed to all this stuff for the mitigation land. But the actual things that you hear about it, and the problems and realities of the animals and the silting, and it needs more work. And I'm trying to get ahead of that curve. We're meeting with a group of the ranchers out in the valley who've been doing living with it their whole lives and so they have a lot of practical things and he is really grateful I'm doing that and wants to implement that information with the Army Corps to push back and get more flexibility on what they do so the mitigation really is a positive thing and that comes back to our dream of having educational and hiking areas there and that's what I'm going to be pushing with him and so I'm going to need the community support at the right time to advocate for that because it's still our valley and it'd be a great, it wouldn't cost them much and it would really blend in well and make it a useful part of our valley. So I'm going to be asking for a lot of help. I can't do everything myself. I can come up with the idea, I can advocate, but then I need the power of the people to come behind me. So look forward to that. I meant to bring this up earlier, but digital infrastructure, which is pretty lacking, um, maybe not so much in Willits, but not great in Willits either, but throughout the county, um, digital infrastructure it, and, and um, some of the federal things that are going on are this era's federal aid highway projects from the 1950s that built our superhighways. We, we have an opportunity, just like any other rural communities, maybe countywide, to, build, to get funding to build broadband. And there's a lot of stuff going on around that. I, it's one of the things I think that we could probably work on as a group, if it's important enough, and work with the county. Okay, probably most of you don't know me, uh, but many of you probably know Bill Barker, whose family has been here since 1946. Uh, Bill and I lived here as a young couple in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, and then we left to the Bay Area, and then we came back in 98 when his mother was getting pretty close to 90. So I've been sort of just in and out of the community, but in many ways, excuse me, in many ways, it feels like my hometown, even though I grew up in San Luis Obispo. A uh, couple of things that I thought of as an adult coming back in 98 is, uh, one, one of the things that I would like to see, and it's a dream, 
And if I had the money, I would do it myself. You were the one that was talking about the RVs that they can park out at Evergreen and Burger King and stuff like that. But I've noticed that a lot of RVs that are coming from the north park right in front of Howard Hospital because I think they think there is no place for an RV. We may as well stop here, not realizing if they went a little bit farther, they would find a place where they could park their RV. Because people who drive RVs like to stop in little towns and they like to eat in the restaurants and just sort of look around. Uh, I would take the vacant lot that's right there at the corner of commercial. If I could buy that whole thing, including the, the cafe, I would turn the cafe into an information center and have public restrooms because, quite frankly, we need public restrooms and plenty of parking so that RVs could park as they're coming south and then take a walk downtown. Another thing that bothers me is that we talked about and I think it was you again, about the revenue that comes from the south end of town. And yet when we decorate for Christmas, which I always think is too late, uh, we don't put any at the south end of town. We don't put any of the 4th of July stuff. So spread it out a little bit more. Show that the southern end of town is also our town and that we respect them. I would like to see that. I would like to see as one community not downtown and the south end. Because <laughs> that's the sort of the feeling I get. <laughs> and yet they do bring in a lot of revenue. So I would like to see decorations going. One of the eyesores that I've noticed is the restrooms that are at the park where we have the car show. When we first came back, Bill and I, excuse me, had a little bit more money than we have now because since we've been here, we've gotten 11 great-grandchildren <laughs> <laughs> since 98. So, but we actually offered to volunteer, to find volunteers and to spruce it up, paint it, put flowers, get better doors with better locks, hooks so the women can hang their purses up, and we were told we couldn't do that. Later on, when they did the park out there for the kids, then they came back and said, would you like to donate $10,000 for one of the new bathrooms? Well, by then, we didn't have that kind of money anymore because we have 11 great-grandchildren. <laughs> and for Christmas, I've talked to a number of businesses that I think, I know you don't like big box stores, but one thing that, they could, that you could learn from them is marketing. How many of you wait until after Thanksgiving before you first start thinking of Christmas. Most of us start before that. And I don't think having decorations up before Thanksgiving takes anything away from Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving is a whole different thing. That's a meal. Uh, I've often suggested also that it could be a theme each year. And this, if you start at this before the bypass goes through, then people after the bypass say, let's go through and see what the theme is like maybe all the businesses they could have winter wonderland they could have snowflakes in their windows along with their you know their products that they're trying to sell another year it could be one of the neat things is the churches have really gotten together and do things together now oh is my time up oh one of the things that i think you could have one theme one year where just blessings to all where some might put in a Jewish thing, somebody might put something else in, uh, just their own feelings or the Christian churches, because I kind of miss that. So, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm here with this group of young women. They are the youth advocates, and they're being shy tonight. I hope they will change their mind and come up and speak for themselves. Um, until then, I will... Uh, go ahead and represent um, some of the things that I know we care about as a group in our town. Um, uh, last year we worked on a project th with the Office of Traffic Safety. We did walk together, Jed, and um, what we noticed was that the streets, I mean, we kind of knew this, but we documented it, um, Della Avenue and Franklin Street, which are routes that go directly um, to Blosser Lane Elementary are in very, very poor condition. We would like sidewalks and bike lanes and street lights along these streets. I don't know if you 
are aware of this, but students are discouraged from walking or biking to Blosser Lane School because it's not safe. And I know I walk to school, I bike to school, and I'm probably, I'm going to guess that many of you in the room did too, but our children are not able to do that safely. It's, um, it's really scary, actually, to walk down those roads. Yes, it is dangerous. I don't think that's the answer. I don't think the answer is don't walk or bike to school. We can do something about that. And we do know that there's Safe Routes to School funding and that you have a Safe Routes to School plan, and we would love to see that happen. Um, another thing that we noticed this year was um, the California Healthy Kids survey data. So this is a survey that is given to 7th, 9th, and 11th grade students in our community. Um, and it asks questions about positive things in their lives and maybe negative things in their lives. And there was some really shocking um, data that we came across from our students right here in Willits. Um, we have extremely high rates of alcohol use for our young people. 11% of 11th graders stated that they had seriously considered attempting suicide. 11% of 11th graders, that's one out of 100, two, one, anyways, 11 out of 100, 11th graders right here in Willis said they had seriously considered attempting not ever thought about it, but seriously considered attempting. Um, so Youth Advocates wants to work with local businesses and community to, to talk about access to alcohol, advertising to alcohol, um, and they are concerned about the um, promotion of it to the future customers is what, what they said. One thing they are willing to do about it, which they have started last week, is they are now going to the Bechtel Grove Middle School Kids Club after school and mentoring younger students there and being role models and examples of, you know, that not everybody is doing it. Could, could I just talk to this to the side thing for a second? Yeah, and I'm done. The other thing we have in this community is a high rate of uh, juvenile homelessness. And I don't think people have any idea how high it is. These are couch surfing kids. But as far as, the home, as far as suicide, that's one of the things we see really clearly with some of the kids we're working with. Not suicides, but low self-esteem. You have kids, so many kids, not allowed to do sports, not allowed to do music. Their grades are bad. They think they're worthless. There is nothing making them feel good. They're living in a society right now that talks about, oh, it's the end of oil, it's this, this bad, that's bad. Too many people in the world, they hear negative, 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 and they feel worthless. And something, that's right, turn off the TV, get in, and when they make something with their hands for the first time, and they start actually feeling good about themselves. We have seen kids turn themselves around so incredibly well. It's, but they need something to do that they can feel good about themselves. Because that's where the suicide stuff and the suicidal thoughts comes from. So I'm Jay McCabe, and um, I'm uh, one of the people that are facilitating this. But I have a concern. I have a concern about the potholes that we talked about before in, in our streets and on our sidewalks. And it's not a brand new concern. It's a current concern I've had ever since I've lived here. It hasn't been all that long, but 14 years. 14 years, folks. I know we can do something about some of these things. Now, we don't need to fix all of them at once, but honestly, honestly, come on. A little hot mix would take care of a lot of that problems on the alley. That alley is, actually, that's where we get a lot of our tourists and our entertainment are using the alleyways right there for Wolf's Community Theater, I mean, for Shaunakee's Pub, which brings in a lot of music and actually is a nice little 
um, community asset. But that, that person that fell, I've got her picture on my, on my phone. She's one of my best friends. She's got a shiner this big. She went to emergency. She hurt her hands. She hurt her knees. She's the third one of my friends that have fallen in that area. Now, that's not something we, we need to fix pretty soon. That's something we need to fix right away. Because honestly, my friend does not want to sue the city. I, I actually encouraged her. And I'm not that kind of a person. But I said, 14 years and nothing has happened. Come on, Linda. So we need to take charge and do something about it. Couldn't we just get a little group together to do some hot mix and shovels and pound it down? Come on, really. <laughs> I'd like to respond to that. I am on MCOG and the city does have a grant proposal in and I'm certainly pushing it and I think it's going to happen. It's for 65000 for the alleys and there's a group meeting and the city's involved in this. And it is going to happen, but part of that money is for a charrette, they call it, where you all come, put in your input, and we decide how to do it, lighting, lots of issues, underground, a whole bunch of problems. But it is going to happen, we are committed to making it happen, and it's great to hear that other people are pushing it. I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not going to sit here and advocate for bad streets, uh, it, but, but I can also tell you that as... Uh, one that is, we try and pave as many streets as we can. Um, it is, and it's not as easy as I, I would like it to be, or as easy as, as everybody wants to make it sound. Uh, at the same time, we want to go put asphalt on a street. We hear from the ADA people that we've got to bring all everything into compliance. So you know, we did Central Street. The asphalt cost on Central Street was about $120,000, $110,000. That was the cost of the asphalt. It was a $1.4 million project. And that's what we had to do in order to put down $100,000 worth of asphalt. We would have been happy to put down $100,000 worth of asphalt. But we had to spend $1.4 million to bring it into compliance with the rules that that we're, we're, we're governed by. I also say that, that, you know, the same people that complain to me about their street being rough come back to me after we pave it and bitch to me that people drive too fast on the street. <laughs> so it is a no-win deal, but I'm, I'm not standing here to we say know. that people should be falling down because of the sidewalks or whatever, but you got to walk them walk a little bit in my shoes or the people that sit up on the city council shoes. We live in this town. We don't live somewhere else, folks. We live here. We're driving those same streets every day. We know exactly what it is. And we're trying to get that work done. We, we went and, and got, we're in a lucky position. We're the only community in, in Mendocino County that I think has a street improvement project, a, a dedicated funding to do that. You know, we have we we are working on Humboldt Street this year. That's a, to try and finish Humboldt Street. It's been a two-year project or a three-year project. I, I don't I want to I don't want to take up more time. On this, but. Thank you, Bruce. Hi, I'm Jim Merrill, and I just wanted to add on to what Madge had said about special districts. I mean, um, you said recreation districts, but sometimes that's a confusing term, and I want to ask questions out there because. Uh, what kind of special district could we create? And it might be a recreation district, it might not. But if we had a, a special district that could help fund the things that we want to fund, like Madge was talking about, whether it's the art center or the skate park or lots of different kinds of things, I would like to see, you know, get a list of what do we want to fund and is it possible? What are the possibilities? And I'm asking all of you up there and all of you out there to see if you have any ideas about that. Thank you. I'll address that because I brought that up a number of times. I don't claim to necessarily be the uh, originator of that idea, but it's, it gets tossed around periodically. But uh, a special district, uh, we have 
a number in the community. Uh, the most successful probably is the Little Lake Fire Protection District. The Little Lake Fire is totally independent of the city. They used to be a part of the city in the, in the early 60s. It, it separated out to be an independent district. Obviously, its borders extend beyond the city limits of the city of Willits. There's a cemetery district uh, that you pay a little bit. Those of you that pay property tax, look at your property tax. Bill, you'll see this. You'll see all those special districts. Fort Bragg just, you know, Fort Bragg uh, had a wonderful benefactor whose, whose name escapes me uh, that built them a new aquatic center. And so they built this $5 million, multi-million dollar facility, opened it for a year and a half and they were broke. You know, they did not, they couldn't afford to heat the pool. Uh, and so they were broke. So they, uh, they formed a special district uh, just to, for, and, and to my understanding, to, to operate that facility. My idea has always been to, to, to put together a variety of facilities that, that the city has sole responsibility for and has had sole responsibility uh, forever. And those are the ball fields, it's the skate park, it's the tennis courts, it's the Bechtel Grove gym, it's the the Cultural Arts Center, and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to leave some out, but... Swimming pool. Swimming pool, a big one, swimming pool. Arguably, you know, there's twelve to 15,000 people in the 954-90 area, of which clearly 5,000 of them reside in Willits. So there's a, to me, there's a legitimate argument that Willits probably represents a third of the use of those facilities. And it's a kind of a, it's in a sense it'd be a test of if, you know, whether it's a $10 per $100,000 assessed increment or whatever it may be, but you put that, you create, and I'm going to look to the, and Adrian and I and, and others of the city have, it's on our radar screen to try and put us a little bit into the budget this year to, uh, doing the homework and doing the work that would take to, or I hope to get support from my council to, to do a, the legwork it would take to, to see about creating a special district. But clearly at the city, we really struggle to fund all of those facilities on our own that are regionally used. Just all, the whole unincorporated area have, uh, have the advantage of those facilities. And we use Brook Trails Park Course, you know what I mean? They, they had a ball fields that were being used uh, likewise, and maybe, maybe those go to it too as well. I have no idea, but we're going to try and make, I'm going to try and make a, a more concerted effort. It usually comes up just during budget time when the, when the community service people come in and are looking for their little bit of support for the year, and, uh, you know, when we have this discussion, then it fades away, but so we're going to try and, and get a little institutional ap approach at it this year. I am a, allegedly an anti-tax person, but I would totally support local communities taxing themselves for specific things. And this would be a great one to commit to youth for the swimming pool, the tennis courts, and recreation. There's going to be a race for tax issues. The county is going to do one for roads, and you kind of want to jump in on that because they don't have one. And everybody wants to fund something with a little bit more sales tax. So the first two or three that win will get you up to as much as anybody wants to pay, and that will be that. But I would think it would be wonderful to do this for the youth of our town. It would be a long-term commitment and stabilize. The city is going to have challenging financial times for the foreseeable future like the county. So if this community wants something, we should tax ourselves. We could even do another half cent sales tax for roads. It's whatever your priorities are. You have to look at the whole field of them. That's what I'm trying to get the board to do. And pick your priorities, which means we're not going to prioritize these other things. But pick what you want the most and do it. On the recreation district, I have started some of the, some of the footwork on that. It does have to go through LAFCO. But one of the things that I have to think about as a policymaker, and I think we all do, is that that's none of it. What are the priorities? I would like more recreation opportunities. I would really like more trails, more access to what's beautiful around here, because that's, that's what we have is an incredible 
community and incredibly beautiful surroundings. But very few people have access to trails and things like that. Probably the closest is brook trails. You know, the park horse is wonderful, but if you don't have a car, there are 20 other trails. Right. We'll say that I pretty much agree with almost everything that's been brought up here. Uh, one of the things that hasn't been brought up um, is our rivers, our creeks. I would love it if we could have more, if we could highlight our creeks so that they're an asset and not just a place for vagrants to hang out um, and drug use and who knows what goes on down there. Places like Ashland or even Santa Rosa have highlighted their creeks that are running through their town. And we have many. I mean, the fact is, is I grew up here and I had no idea that salmon were right behind Willits High. You know, but that's out there. And so if, if kids and our community had more access to that, I think it could really be a benefit. Uh, my name's Kevin Copperfield. And it sounds like what's near and dear to me has been touched on in terms of recreation for the youth of our town. I have a son who's 12, and he has some cousins, and they're involved in community sports. My specific suggestion was to throw out to everybody here that I think would be a great improvement in our town, and we almost got it, was another gymnasium. We're finding it hard to get any practice time for our kids that are on these basketball teams to, to get uh, space for the games that are, good, that are in Ukiah. And I remember the kids club, and originally there was a plan to have a gymnasium tacked on to that project, but for various reasons, uh, the gymnasium never materialized. But what did materialize, the kids club is a wonderful facility uh, being used all the time. But I think a lot of folks are kind of counting on that gymnasium to pop up slash recreation area for to be another avenue for kids to have something to do after school. Um, and then this time of year where it's hard to get <coughs> practice time in our Woolwich facilities, but this gymnasium would have been a nice thing to have. So it sounds like people are already meditating on, on this and the special district and recreation is front and center, and that's great. Um, my only thought was specifically uh, if we can uh, get another gymnasium in town slash rec center. I'll tell you, I'll be willing to, to throw in a tank of gas a year or two tanks of gas a year on my property taxes. I know the kids were getting a little extra to to give them something to do. We've already heard 11% uh, suicide rate, uh, potentially. Um, the kids do need a little something extra to do. And I'm all for, you know, putting my wallet up there for some money to do it. Um, and I think if, um, you know, mayors address that and Jim and Holly, if we can, in time, we can get something rolling on a special district. At least give the, our community an opportunity to vote on this thing if, it, if that's what it takes. And um, I'm going to show this is how much money will get us this. If you want to pony up this much in your property tax or whatever, this is what you'll get. I think if it's presented in some way similar to that, I think, uh, you know, I'd like to see that. I, anyway. do, I do just want to add on to what Kevin's saying, which is the other thing that I have in my mind as a policymaker is our firehouse. And it's not sexy. And the fact is, is that there are a number of people in our community that feel like they're being nickel and dimed on their taxes. So as much as I want recreation, we have to make sure that we have a really strong case for it and that people really know where the money's going and that it would, you know, be handled properly. But also I'm thinking I don't want to compete with a fire department, you know, uh, district, you know, they might be considering that as well. It's just, when it comes to our priorities, safety is also important. Less kids, less kids with nothing to do, less fires. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Randy Coven. This is a really great event. I want to thank the organizers and all the speakers. Really great information. I've agreed with just about everything that's been said here. The one thing that hasn't been said I don't see how we can talk about the future of Willits without talking about marijuana tourism. 
I know it's a controversial subject. It just seems absolutely insane to me for us to let this opportunity go by. We've been growing here for many years. There's a lot of expertise here. There's a lot of uh, already uh, thriving farms. Uh, there, there are going to be marijuana resorts somewhere in Northern California. Why not make it here? Why not let Willits be little Amsterdam? Uh, you know, the, the biggest complaint, I think, when it's talked about that I hear people say is about the kids. People will start talking about the, the negative effects of marijuana on kids. Anybody can get marijuana in Willits and anywhere. You know, you don't, we don't have to have a, a bed and bud and breakfast, as Robin Leller mentioned uh, at one point, in order for kids to have access to marijuana. Kids have access to marijuana. They have access to alcohol. It's no different than having a winery. Uh, so I, I, I just think we really need to talk about that. Uh, Peter Koch uh, has related to uh, money, the cost of things. Uh, when you get to a certain point, you can't reduce your costs anymore. You have to increase your revenue, uh, which is what I think we need to do here in Willits. Uh, I've lived in a number of towns that have had uh, thriving tourist industries. I like tourists. They come, they spend a lot of money, and they go home. So you don't have the huge cost of infrastructure that you have to deal with. But in order to get more visitors to Willits, you have to give them a reason to come here. Now this is not so much the job of the city, it's the job of the uh, economic community, the business people in town, who should figure out some way, how do we get more people to Willits? Some of the towns I've lived in, and, and Willis would be ideal for that. And in fact, our mayor would probably jump in on this one. Once a year for a three-day weekend, have a bluegrass festival, perhaps over Memorial Day uh, weekend. Over Labor Day weekend, in some communities, we have a beautiful valley. I'd love to see it from a balloon. You bring in and have a weekend of, of, of balloon uh, tours over the valley. You can have events like... Uh, renting bicycles in town during the 4th of July, which brings a tremendous amount of revenue to the city, uh, and ride bicycles through the valley. So there are things that can be done, but I think they have to drive through the local business community, the Chamber of Commerce, and uh, uh, because they're the ones ultimately that benefit the most because they have customers for the restaurants, the gas stations, uh, the hotels, uh, and, of course, the city gets the uh, sales tax revenue, so that will help the city out. So, uh, you know, I don't know if anybody from the local business community is here, but uh, uh, if you are, please consider joining the chamber or getting the chamber to do something along those lines. Thank you. I was really concerned to hear about people wanting, young people wanting to commit suicide. <laughs> If you have an un unhappy child who's failing classes and cannot participate in any of the dances, any of the athletic activities, any of the field trips, it gets worse. I got to talk about school because I spent so much of my life. I want to speak to what you talked about. When I was at Willits High School, and it wasn't that I was a genius, it's just that I fought for things. We had homemaking. We had mechanical drafting. We had a nursing program. It was lot, Some of these were ROP programs, but they actually put a trailer in, and we had nursing program. We had auto shop, wood shop, ag shop, which was welding and so on, uh, construction class, I think, uh, business class and typing, things that that aren't there anymore. And you talk about kids being involved. If they're involved, they're happy. And I, I may have been naive, but when I was there, I was happy. I loved going to work every day. And I talked to kids all the time. Some of my best friends are people in the community that I was lucky enough to have done something uh, in their life. But they seemed to like to go to school and, you know, I had, I had the kids that got drunk and so on, and I had, yeah, I, I don't want to get in all of that stuff. <laughs> I'm going to end by the last thing, is I hope to God that we don't make Willits 
a headquarters for the marijuana industry, okay? As an educator, I dealt with that stuff. If you take a, if you take a, a, a less than intelligent young person and have him smoke dope, you got a real problem, okay? I lived through that. I can remember the helicopters flying over the ridge coming out of brook trails, and I was I was catching kids with handfuls of marijuana seeds, and uh, it anyway, I, I've said enough. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming here. And what you're doing is really wonderful. I got to speak. With you. I got to say one more thing. There is a trail that goes from the end of Della Avenue, the other end, that comes into the Blosser Lane. So they don't have to walk down Della if they're that way. I just wanted to clarify that. There was no sidewalk coming down the road, and uh, we, had, we had to get people, and it took a lot of fighting. I had to get a guard down at Highway 20 because kids were walking across that street. Yeah. It was scary. So I just fought and fought and fought, and I finally got somebody that was there that would stop traffic, and the Caltrans wouldn't put a stoplight in there. So anyway, that's what we did. Thank you very much for your time. I want to address one more thing. I did go to school here. I was born here. Um, raised here, family been here since 48, in the county since 1911. Um, if you want, I, I believe what Chuck said about the drug problem. The drug problem, you know, there's so much people trying to figure out how to make the drugs work because, yeah, they see the funding. But when I got out of school, we went to work because there was trades to go to. We felt good about life. And until you get the industry back in here, you're not going to get your kids really into it. They're not, they don't have a future because there's nothing here for them. They have to go to the cities to work. We had industry here that exported products. People could make a decent living and have any kind of vehicle you wanted. I mean, back then, you know, it wasn't ma- you know, Ferraris and stuff. A Corvette was your big thing in life, you know. And you could buy that working at Remco or working in logging. I mean, these were good producing jobs. Now, my father logged since 1937. He lived, he did police work also, but he lived out in, in uh, camps. The railroad used to go out there. This was before truck and cat logging and all that. This was railroads and steam donkeys and stuff. He caught the last part of that and then moved into the cat logging and stuff. But there was so much stuff. Remco built stuff. They built stuff for NASA. They built stuff for the United States Navy. If we just had the trough covers alone that went on aircraft carriers, a wear out item, a replaceable item, if we just had that job alone that would fund 300 people to work in a factory like Remco. We did the offshore drilling. You know, we did so many things that were specialized that you were proud of. We made, a, we made three cylinders for Disneyland and a project for Disneyland. We made a cylinder that I've got on the back of my jacket that was built and it took some real skill. It lifted a platform for NASA and had to be put together. It couldn't be hauled out on a truck. He went through the tallest part of the building, 15 feet above the tallest part of the building, and it was 70 feet in the ground when they tested it. It was 137 feet long. And the rod itself was timed, specially machined, that when it was put together, it had to be timed in four places because it had a thread on the outside that an air nut went around. So if it ever lost hydraulic pressure, the people would not come crashing down because it was a platform for people to work on space stuff at NASA. This, the, the, in, the ingenuity from that engineering department, they had a full sales crew, a full engineering department right here in Willits. That was quite a, quite a place to be. That was a place to be when you came out of Willits and they had a program teaching machinists. Willits High School students come out of there and got to go to Remco and become machinists learn trades that they could take anywhere. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Sort of on that same line and also on the line of having weekend special events,
i had a really nice conversation today at the grange breakfast with a couple of our local inventors who are really have been working in alternative energy electric vehicles light rail and they have wonderful visions and skills and knowledge and those are things we could turn into both a tourist draw and local businesses in industry that could be a draw for our you know for jobs so all it takes is critical mass getting that going i just want to put a word in for our creative local inventor types Thank you all for your participation. It was um, juicy. <laughs> it was good. That's why, why I love the town halls, because we all get to talk to one another uh, about what we think, and, and not just talk, but listen. It's important. There's, you know, there's so much technology now, and that's not with people face to face, and I think that keeps us from having as much trust and um, support in our community as we could have. Face to face, is, it just can't be replaced not with any kind of technology. Um, and with that, uh, it's time for our community announcements. So if you have anything that's going on in community, please come up and announce it. I'm Adrian Moore, I'm the city manager. And I wanted, you know, I listened to all the comments tonight about what everybody wants to see, and I can assure you that everyone at the city wants to see the same things. So we really are on the same page as far as that goes, but it comes down to money at the end of the day. So with that, I wanted to inform all of you of an upcoming community workshop, Saturday, March 28th, and that'll be across the street at the community, uh, sorry, the uh, Arts Center at 9 o'clock in the morning until noon. And what we're really looking for here is community participation. Um, the council and staff will be looking at the budget and, and looking forward to our annual budget process, and it's important that we understand what our resources are, and that we understand what the community wants, and likewise that the community understand uh, the decisions that the council has to make. Hi, I had a couple things I wanted to announce. One, every Monday night at Wowser, open to the public at 6 p.m. from 6 to 8, we have different seminars. This coming Monday, Sacred American, no, Na yeah. Sacred Geometry, sorry. But there's a different subject where you can learn something every single Monday night at 6 o'clock. And it is a sacred design, sorry. And it is open to anyone in the public. It's free. And it's free. And the second thing is the first of every month at 1 o'clock, we have the Inventors Club. And it's called NorCal Inventors. And we get people from four different counties coming to this. And this is one way that we're trying to populate our area. While we have some amazing inventors here, we're gathering them together for, for potential ideas of things we could do and make and have in Willis. Cindy, you said the first of every month? I'm sorry, the first Saturday of every month. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Lila. And there's some flyers on the chair here if you want. Can I, can I just say, there's also going to be electric cars Is there a following Mondays Thing down at Lowser. Yeah. Your electric cars uh, should be fine. Um, I'm an herbalist and a nutritional counselor, and I'll be starting my spring classes soon. Um, in the spring, at least, through early summer, once a month. So the first one will be an herb walk on um, the 14th of, uh, excuse me, the 15th of uh, March. And on the 14th, I'm going to be doing a natural pet care class. <coughs> But I also wanted to address, I, I didn't want to let it go un, un, unanswered, uh, and Randy and I agree on a lot of things, and maybe this will alienate me from everybody here, but I could not be more opposed to the idea of making Willits or Mendocino County some kind of a, a marijuana bed and breakfast destination point. And personally, I do see... I do see a connection with the struggles that our young people have in this community and that culture. And I think promoting that culture in our community is just a huge mistake. And as long as you elect me to the Willett City Council, don't expect me to support that kind of an endeavor in our community. I just, I just got to be clear about that. I, it just doesn't work for me.
community announcement. It's a little farther ahead, and that's on March 22nd, which is also a Sunday, 4 o'clock. Seems like Sundays at 4 o'clock is a nice time to have a meeting. Uh, that one is going to be about local investing, and we're going to have John Curry from the um, um, Economic Development Finance Corporation talking about um, both the investing end of things, so people who have money instead of putting it in Wall Street or even at the banks that actually send all the money somewhere else. Um, if we get to put our money into our local economy. And then the other side of that coin is for local entrepreneurs who want loans to start up business or to expand their business. So it's both um, you know, benefit for people that have some money to invest and for people who need money to start and create their businesses. So um, John Curry is a really wonderful resource and he'll be the main speaker. I, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate, um, I, I just appreciate us being able to get together and talk and listen to one another. It's um, the only place I see it happening, except maybe at Ardella's, <laughs> oh, now the Brick House, but it, it's just very worthy, I think. And we're going to be having a, another town hall meeting in April. We've got two dates we haven't decided yet on either April the 19th or the 26th. They're both Sundays. It'll be at 4. Uh, and we intend to carry on doing this uh, pretty much kind of quarterly, four or five times a year. But we hope that if you have a topic or something just popped into your head, come up and tell us. And thanks so much for coming and participating because it wouldn't be that much fun to just sit here by ourselves. And <laughs>